Hey everybody, welcome back to 10th Century. Today we are talking about AGM-88 Harm and the development of that missile, the things that made it different from its predecessors. And because this is part two, we're also going to be talking about its pairing with the F4G Wild Weasel, which was the subject of part one. So if you haven't watched that, go back and watch it before you listen to this one. I'm joined today by T. Bear Larson and E.T. Johnson, who you remember from the first interview, but also by Star Baby Petruca and also Bassa Baxley, who are two new guests. If you want to know when part three is coming out, which will deal with the subject of what happened after Desert Storm and the Balkans conflicts and the uh, state of wild weaseling today, then hit subscribe and hit the bell button and you'll get a notification from YouTube. As always, your comments are really appreciated. Sharing this, liking it, and generally letting people know that it's out there is a helpful thing to me and I'd appreciate your support in that regard. Anyway, I'll stop talking and leave you to enjoy. E.T., T-Bear, thanks for coming back for part two on this uh, special Wild Weasel series, 10% True. Uh, my guests at home will astutely notice that we have two new guests, one of them in the course of undressing. Uh, he's finished now. Star Baby. And in the top right-hand corner is Bassa. Um Guys, do you want to introduce yourselves quickly before we get on with the business at hand? Sure, I'll go ahead. Um, Brian back fully. Uh, Flew F4Gs for 10 years uh, throughout Southeast Asia, Europe, and uh, the United States. Got to find Desert Storm had about uh, 25 or 6 night combat sorties. Fired about 12, 15 harms. Uh, when that was done, I ended up my tour in the Air Force uh, flying F-15Cs. Um, so, and got to fly Operation Iraqi Freedom flying F-15Cs. So, uh, with that, uh, Star Baby. Uh, Star Baby, Mike Petruca. I am one of the latecomers, so I actually joined the F4G just after Desert Storm. Like everybody else in the U.S., I watched Desert Storm on CNN uh, and basically was one of the guys that pretty much rounded out the end of the program uh, and then later transitioned to uh, Strike Eagles. I've got about 80-some-odd combat missions in the Weasel uh, over northern and southern Iraq, and uh, Bassa was uh, my lead pilot, my crewed pilot, for uh, several of those uh, deployments, um, we make a great team. If a slightly goofy one. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, gents. So, so for, for everybody at home then, if you are tuning in and this is the first time you've seen this, go back and watch the first um, interview which had uh, T-Bear and E.T. and also Lucky Ekman in it. That, that will set you set the scene for this second conversation. And so the idea behind this this second panel conversation then is having originally talked about the F4G in the first conversation, we're going to talk about the HARM missile, the AGM-88 high-speed anti-radiation missile, um, and hopefully understand a little bit about what generated the interest in that missile. So what it... Uh, was doing in terms of replacing the Shrike AGM-45 and then the standard arm, which I think was the AGM-78. So maybe understand a little bit about what those two missiles were in terms of capabilities and, and why we ended up, or why the US ended up developing the AGM-88. And then as we progress through that story then, to look at how the pairing of the AGM-88 and the F4G worked in Operation Desert Storm in January 1991. So that's the general idea behind this conversation. Um, I don't know who wants to start, but but can we start by understanding a little bit about what was good and what was bad about the Shrike and the Standard Arm? What was it that led the Air Force or the, and the Navy to develop the uh, the AGM-88? It was straightforward. Uh, 105 and F-4C days, you had to have um, multiple different secret heads for Shrikes uh, based on where what you thought the threat were, and you had to load up the correct missile for the correct threat of the day. Uh, so you had to mix and match, and if you were uh, had the wrong secret head for the threat that you were up against, you were SOL. Uh, so uh, I don't know, Ed. I don't. You may recall what we had uh, dash two. Probably about six different uh, dash numbers, and that's how you kept track of the which secret head you had. And in fact, uh, in 105s, we had to keep track. We had different ones on left and different versus the one on the right, 
and you had to keep track of which was which to make sure you, you're shooting the right strike to uh, match the threat. Uh, secondly, the, the ranges of the uh, 45 were relatively short. It was based on a Navy research rocket, actually. And uh, uh, the, you weren't outside the lethal range of the threat you're shooting at. So you had to mix and match. You're in a knife fight, in essence. The, the intent of the Navy, uh, who's been the developer of all these things, was to develop uh, HM-78 off of a standard arm uh, airframe because it was one they were very familiar with. General Dynamics made it on their shipboard uh, uh, intercept missions. And so they said, that's easy. We can adapt this to an airframe, uh, put an arm front end on it. And that'll allow us to do several things, cover a wider frequency spectrum and uh, um, enable off-axis uh, shooting more reliably and uh, uh, launch from a level flight and it would do an up and over uh, type uh, approach. Um, the, the downside was it was a monster. Uh, it, it was a big missile with the carriage you had to put on it. You, you dragged your, just about dragged your butt every time taken off. And it didn't uh, fulfill all the requirements of the off access and, and the frequency spectrum. Um, uh, so the Navy went in and then the Air Force uh, uh, later on joined in. They didn't want to expend all their R&D dollars on uh, harm because they had the R&D dollars put into the F4G in order to transition F4G. So they lately uh, joined the HARM program. There were people monitoring the HARM program, but uh, we weren't actively involved. Actively involved uh, translates dollars. <laughs> and if you ain't bringing dollars, you can't really change the requirements. Well, the Air Force finally dropped in with the uh, uh, dollars and uh, helped influence the addition of the uh, just a, uh, a few frequency changes, uh, uh, additional frequency spectrum for the harm. And uh, um, we jumped in to try and uh, in, uh, change the off access capability to widen that to, to uh, a wider portion of it so you could in level flight fire it off, off axis, uh, increase the range. Uh, and that was done th through some other booster uh, changes. And obviously, everybody's uh, interest was uh, increase the PK. And that was uh, uh, driven by some software changes. And it was always refined as we went through the development of it to try and uh, we were more uh, without using actual numbers. You were you were kind of shooting in the wind uh, with the, the Shrike. And the 78 did some kind of an improvement on it. but. Uh, the increase in the uh, software, missile guidance software that was available in HARM allowed it to have a, a refined trajectory, steeper uh, come in, and so therefore made the warhead more effective without getting into the classified aspects of it. Um, those things, longer range, more off axis, higher frequency spectrum, and let me call it memory or or remembering a little bit where the the site was, if it did go off the air, so there went to a place, place on the ground where the missile at least thought the, the radar site was, and maybe get some kind of a kill. And an, a, an upgraded PK where all of the, the things that went behind the requirements of uh, the harm missile. So I never touched a Shrike or a standard, um, although I trained for Shrike shots. And, you know, for the for the techno geeks among you, there were a couple other issues with the Shrike. Uh, one was that it used aluminum powder to get extra boost out of the rocket motor, which is not uncommon. And after the Vietnam War, Vietnamese operators reported that they could actually see the cloud of a missile launch um, if they had a guy in their scan volume and that that would cue them that they had really locked on to the wrong guy and it was time to shut down. So Shrikes gave away some of the game later on. Um, the 
number all the dash two through dash six through dash eight missiles were eventually replaced by a nine and a ten but pretty much at the time they showed up which were covering you know the the frequency range a wider frequency range than the earlier dash models uh the russians had or the soviets had already moved to the point where they were outside the the frequency range by about 1974 and so that was definitely an obsolescence problem. The other thing that they told me when I was an FTU, and the reason we we never got to play with a standard even in training by 1990, was that rocket motor cracks had basically condemned the entire standard arm uh, fleet so that that was largely off the table. So perversely, the strike stayed, stayed in service longer than the standard did. Except the strike also had rocket motor cracks, but they weren't advertised and... and- this is a, another Pentagon story. Unbelievably, uh, we needed, uh, I don't remember the number. It was, it was a simple number. It was six or $7 million. And, uh, uh I saw Joe Ralston walk into the John and went in and stepped up to the urinal between them. and said, boss, we needed about six or 7 million of, uh, this color money to, to replenish all our Shrike rocket motors. He says, we can find that in the bathroom floor. And I said, is that a go then? He says, we'll find it. And uh, that money was found and we got all the rocket motors replenished for the Air Force side of the house. It was, I mean, that's what happens in the Pentagon. But uh, uh, there were cracks in the rocket motors for Shrike. Uh, to follow up on his uh, burst, we did some testing on uh, Shrike launches versus uh, radars and we did see some, but it all it did is change our tactics a little. So you'd pull up and burst a chaff and you didn't have to shoot a strike anymore and you can get the guy to pull the plug. So, you know, it's suppression, suppression. He, he can't shoot with his radar off and uh, there's no way to quantify suppression. Uh, I'm, I'm of the school of the um, unlimited frequency, 500 pound variant of the arm uh, that uh, puts a, a 500 pound bomb down the throat of the guy, and that's much better effective than any other arm. Yeah, I was just going to add that the uh, so everything you said is uh, uh, aligns with my recollection. I'd also say that the combination of the, uh, in addition, trying to re- remember each, uh, label each station with what kind of shrike you had, <laughs> just led to uh, selecting wrong stations for that particular threat. Um, what you had to have, that site had to be up and transmitting and you essentially had to be pointing at it. So you became very predictable when you would uh, try to launch the strike. And then, of course, if the signal went down, then you would, uh, the strike would miss. And then even if it did hit, it was a fairly small warhead. So all those things, I think, were addressed by the EGM-88. Um, I probably got to fire five or six strikes during uh, my time in the Philippines out of Scarborough Shoals and and you know, from what we could tell, less than half of them would actually would hit the target that was constantly transmitting. And so, uh, when the arm came along, uh, when the harm came along, we were uh, very excited for all the increased uh, capability that it promised, and the much more flexibility and much more survivable. As well as, if it did hit, it was much more likely to do damage. So, um, for me at least, I thought that was a significant step up. Yeah, well, the increased range took us outside of a lot of the threat envelopes, not all of them, but that's that's the beauty of it. You could step outside of his uh, uh, lethal range and, and reach out and touch him. And so, you, in essence, going from a knife fight to a standoff sniper rifle. And, uh, the, in fact, the call sign would, would magnum when, when you launched it. And the, that was a little bit of a downside because uh, the profile went up and over and so some of the guys thought it was a, a launch on them and da 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 da, da. So uh, nighttime is a different world. M- m- most of my missions were at night in Vietnam, and it's a different world than daytime. It is. At nighttime, <laughs> the advantage is you see every missile launch. The disadvantage is for those first couple of seconds, you think every missile launch is aimed at you. So there's a lot of these little adrenaline spikes that come along with night uh with night ops i I prefer day myself one of the big issues with the harm and a series of big issues is as the guys have pointed out it was faster it had a better warhead it had more range 
and it was uh, both software and memory reprogrammable. So you could reprogram it in storage. And, you know, when attached to an F4G, there was a lot of communication between the F4G and the harm um, that, that handled really a lot of possible contingencies and allowed the operator literally to program the harm the way they wanted. The target set they wanted, the alternate options they wanted, you could constrain a lot of the parameters, um, you could let the computer do its thing, or you could dial it in. So for EWOs like me, who really got down to the geek level of the system, uh, I could tell a harm basically what tune to dance on the way into the target. And that was all done through uh, the software capability of the harm. So huge improvement across the board. Yeah, let me put a uh, word in here for uh, the guy that worked for me, uh, Major Byron Beal. If you want to point to somebody that was responsible for range known and the integration in F4G, it was Byron. Um, uh, one smart Jose. Uh, and Byron had uh, uh, was my deputy for software investigation and then ran all the six degree of freedom flyout models uh, that uh, we used as a basis for predicting safety on the ranges before our test launches. And of course, safety is uber all us. And, and, you know, they had a hammer on everything and we would run them in parallel with the Navy and make sure that we were all safe on our launches. And they kept within the range constraints, et cetera, et cetera. And as he ran those, he started going, you know, we can do better than this. And uh, um, he said, uh, we talked about it a little bit. And then when the next time we were down at Texas Instruments in, in Louisville, Texas, we went out with one of the TI fellows and I, I still can't pull, Bob, Bob, I can't pull his name out, but there were five of us sitting around the table at, at, a, at a beer joint. And uh, what if, and the what if ended up being range known. It, it gave that because the F4G was the only platform that gave the range to the emitter. And we started talking about air boundaries and we started saying, well, if we can give, and the harm guy, the CI fellow that was sitting there said, you know, if you can give me within this amount of range, we could shape the whole trajectory and come in steeper, make a higher PK, allow us a more selectivity on uh, to, to, to star babies, uh, select being selective and what targets you're going to hit, et cetera, et cetera. And Byron said, you know, let's get together and run some six stops on that. And they did it. And it was a software change, literally to the missile to optimize its flight path and range known and range unknown were the two modes, primary modes and with the F4G, the primary mode, I would be astounded if they shot very many, uh, not range known. Uh, and, uh, it ended up a boost about, uh, uh, I'll, an eight percent improvement in your PK, uh, just because of the difference in trajectory. But uh, Byron uh, was the was the daddy rabbit of running. Oh man, he'd run, queue it all up, and run six stops overnight. You know, and just and we did it through. It was Air Force unique requirement. Then the Navy started to really like it too. What what is that? What is six degrees of freedom? Uh, it's a modeling of uh, the missile performance. It's a software model of the missile performance based on uh, predictions of the rocket motor, et cetera. And then we would match that with the flight trajectories and refine the model. And it's a classic round and round until the, the model was very, very accurate as far as predicting uh, the trajectory of the flight. If you can model all kinds of things, whether it's aircraft, uh, missiles, even people, uh, or simulators, whatever, and it's just a single point mass is a very fundamental simulator, but the sixth off is the most, it, it accounts for all three directions as well as acceleration in each direction. So that, that gives you the most refined understanding of whatever you're looking at uh, that, that's in movement. But uh, one thing that, um, um, with all that uh, preparation for uh, the harm and, and Desert Storm, one thing that was, uh, I guess, not known to most people on the line was, you know, we'd all fired 
trikes. We'd all, most of us had fired AIM-9s and AIM-7s, and so we'd all had experience with these smaller missiles coming off the plane. But most of us in the line uh, outside of the test squadron had never fired a harm. And so the harm is, is I don't know, five, ten times as heavy. <laughs> and so uh, it was uh, the second night of Desert Storm or something like that. I hadn't fired a harm, and most people hadn't at that point. And so uh, I'm, I must have been – I'm up out of Insur Lake, you know, so we're in uh, the northern part of Iraq, and I can see Baghdad there about uh, – <laughs> as I'm traveling eastbound, it's about 50, 60 miles off the right wing, and we take a harm shot. <laughs> and so the first thing was, it was night, which I'd never fired anything at night. And what happens, it's it's a large, it's it's a large bright light. <laughs> and what do you do? You look at it. <laughs> so, so I'm now completely blinded. And uh, <laughs> it comes off, and about the second it comes off, the whole plane starts shaking. And I thought, what the hell? And um, because, you know, the AAA at night looks like Aladdin's flying carpet and, and you have no depth perception because everything's black above and below there. There are no lights except for that, that wavy AAA carpet plane starts shaking. And all of a sudden poof, there's a large ball of fire on the right side. I was convinced that we'd been hit by that AAA. And uh, anyway, what it turned out to be um, was that there was so much uh, airflow disturbance from that, harm missile exhaust that it had disrupted the flow going down the right intake we had a compressor stall on the right engine <laughs> and so that was the that was the cough of the flame coming out the intake and uh and uh, of course f4 doesn't mean altitude maintain altitude very well so so we immediately started going down into the uh triple a to uh, recover but um so as a consequence we uh that was a major debrief item. And uh, a couple other people actually had the same issue. So we just uh, basically, we developed the habit of just prior to firing, the front seater would put a little bit of back pressure on the stick to get the plane climbing gently. And typically the EWO in the back would fire the missile and it would come off. And at least the pilot would know when the, <laughs> when the EWO said fire <laughs> or when he called Magnum that you'd close your eyes so you don't get blinded. And anyway, so that was... Uh, that was the downside to having a very expensive missile that you never got to test fire is that you showed up first time and it was a little bit of a learning curve, but that was exciting. I thought, man, this is going to be a long walk home. <laughs> <laughs> that was amazing that the, the number of harm shots we had in development and, and uh, operational testing. We never had a problem with uh, uh, engine adjust, engine uh, backfires or, uh, you know, yeah. ingestion and uh, we, and we fired them from almost every altitude you had and every attitude, and we were trying to trying to capture the entire envelope. So that was a new yeah. data point to us. We went, wow, oh, okay, well, it can happen, I guess. But for us, yeah. late arrivals got the opportunity. We late arrivals got the opportunity to look for that. Um, so it was a crew coordination issue because, as Bossa mentioned, the missiles fired from the back. And you really don't want to surprise your front seater by hammering <laughs> off the weapon, right? So... I ended up going through a litany, you know, that would tell the front seater that this was coming, you know, in which I'd say, hey, I'm going to take the six, a notional SA6. And I actually verbalize the button punches. I go through handoff, ready light. And he knows the next thing I'm going to say is Magnum. My thumb's going to go down the pickle button and a steam train's going to leave the wing. Uh, so or I could just ask him what the what the frequency on the radio is. And he'd look down and he'd take care of <laughs> so i never actually thought of that um see that's the difference of being a lieutenant you know coming post gulf war is I, I didn't get all the old ewo tricks that you guys had been developing for 30 years um so it wouldn't have occurred to me but that sequence also allowed the pilot to put a little g a guys a lot of guys would put a little g on the airplane uh, in order to change the flight path so that we weren't going to ingest rocket exhaust uh, when it came off the rail. And well within the, you know, and I mean a little. Uh, well yeah, within just the capabilities. Little, yeah, just a little bit of back stick pressure, that's all. <laughs> yeah. So it's not, I think, entirely correct to talk about the harm as an advance without talking about the APR-47. Uh, in the F4G. So the F4G conversion, and remember, I wasn't there for this, okay? This is all book learning 
you know, from the manuals. Uh, 25 black boxes, 52 antennas. The guys had to remove the gun and the ammunition drum from the, the aircraft. So the first two uh, prototype conversions were actually D models, but the rest of the uh, F4G conversions were all E models, which were the gun equipped slatted F4s, uh, including a couple that uh, had MIG kills in Vietnam, as a matter of fact. Uh, and so all that, that space, all that volume taken up by the gun and the ammunition that had to go. And that's why the, the weasels had that fat looking chin, because we've got 30 some odd antennas in that chin alone, plus other ones scattered around the aircraft. And then at the tip of the tail, there's another one. But this was driven by a computer that was basically a Commodore 64 with two extra threat processing modules using a programming language derived from the Apollo program, which is like noun verb programming, all done on a what was essentially a telephone keypad where everything had to be entered twice. You had to hit the enter display button to get the enter light and then the, hit the button again. So EWOs in the back end up with this great, array of sensor data right in front of them, this little keypad to the right, and very, very fast fingers on your right hand, uh, because that's how all the programming and adjustment was done. And, you know, from my perspective, coming in late, uh, the earlier guys who developed the system had done a marvelous job in pairing up the APR-47 and the harm capabilities. So it's like they were made for each other. Um, but they weren't designed that way. It was guys making all the connections and realizing the potential of both weapon systems that allowed us to end up with such a tightly coupled sensor and weapons deployment array. And that was, that was driven by early on, we realized, because at the same time, we were, we were pulling the RN-101 into the system. We, we had an RN-101 as an inertial guidance system uh, huge upgrade from the basic uh, LN whatever it was that we used uh, an inertial guidance system earlier in the F4. So in That's essence, well. we're going, going from an analog uh, airplane to uh, a digital avionics airplane and all the rest of the gauges and, and interfaces were steam driven. So we had so many uh, fricking uh, translators on the platform to integrate uh, <clears throat> The digital uh, uh, INS with the the uh, digital harm and the digital APR thirty eight with the vacuum driven uh, gauges of the airspeed indicators and and uh, AOA et cetera and all those things fed in to uh, the stuff. Uh, I, I I take your your statement accurately. We it was ebb and flow back and forth for those of us that were doing flight tests in the in the early. Uh, APR 38, uh, before it became the 47, uh, the APR 38 uh, flight test guys were the same flight test guys testing harm. And as soon as we saw that differences in the handoff, et cetera. Now, remember that the first time I flew the F4G, uh, it had an 8K memory, 8K, <coughs> not meg, K, in a 50 pound box, 47 and a half pound box to fit in that old ammunition drum. And they, when we upgraded it, uh, and it went from what to 64 is what we ended up going operational with, 64K uh, computer that we went operational with. Well, when you're talking about uh, a software language, uh, every, every, one, every word counted. I mean, literally, we were, we were jam packed. Uh, when you think about what the, just the ranging algorithm alone took to uh, measure all those uh, phases of arrival on the, all the phases, compare the four quadrants, and do the correlation for all the emitters that were up there and put it up on the pan displays. The displays themselves were state of the art. They were coming to us for the uh, new displays that they were putting in the F-22, F-30, or F-22, F-23 because it was a fly off between those two airplanes. They're coming to us because of our experience with the, the displays, the displays were just, and that was another whole separate story. The number, of, we had an argument about uh, how, how, what's the highest number we should have on there? Well, we don't want to go to double digits. I said, 
some of us were in the know at the time, which is <laughs> double digits is academic. You got to go at least to the, the 18. And, uh, and they went, no, no, we don't have to. And oh, it was just, it was a, uh, it was crazy. But that being driven, all of a sudden we started working on the harm. We went, oh my word, how can we fit harm in too? And that became the driver for the first phase of uh, the performance upgrade program because in order to host harm on board, you had to generate all the data Star Baby's talking about uh, to package it, to ship it across the line to the harm. Because harm, uh, think of it as a, uh, uh, had, to, had, to, had to receive the data and it was a blank piece of paper that you had to write on and tell what to do. And literally the day uh, we went, we had a problem, we, we didn't have a problem. One of the issues with our iot and &E was to ascertain for certain that we could fit the harm module in the F4G. And uh, Stu Stegens and who else? There was like 10 Air Force guys and 50 engineers at McDonnell Douglas and St. Louis Smack Air. Uh, and we uh, literally went word by word through the whole list of harm module and APR 38 model doing the trade to fit it in. We fit it in with, I think, eight or 10 words left over. Uh, and, and yeah, we can fit it in and do it. And the outcome of that um, was that when you shot a Shrike back in the day, you basically gave the Shrike the emitter zip code. When you shot a harm, if you dialed it in and you'd let the system range, you gave the uh, you gave the harm the guy's street address, um, the apartment number, and in some cases, what room the guy was in and what color his hair was. That's the kind of level of specificity you were getting with a harm handoff from the F4G to the AGM-88. Yeah, and there was, uh, if my recollection serves me correct, one of the later softwares changes updates that we got on the uh, APR 47 just before Desert Storm included the ability to um, superimpose your route on the yeah. display. So From up, the up until then, yeah, so up until then, you know, I mean, uh, even in the F-15 that I flew later and, and you know, the F-4Es that, uh, that I flew, you know, all, all the uh, radar warning receivers were all just based off of signal strength and had an approximate uh, approximate location along that azimuth. But uh, but with, with the APR-47, you could actually see your route and, and um, be able to ascertain where all the threats were. So anyway, relative, for me, that was... Your route. Yep. Yes. So for me, that was a profound increase in situational awareness uh, to have that. And... Uh, I don't know if all the current fighters have that, but I certainly hope so because that was uh, that was for me was a game changer. Yeah, so we, we, it, it was interesting how that was implemented in that the you actually got five waypoints that you could add in, all with different coordinates. Yeah. But the only symbol they had left that you could use was the asterisk. So basically, you're you're constructing a constellation of your route. And as aviators, we just all fill in the imaginary lines because we've studied the route beforehand. We have the references and there we go. So five asterisks, because I think it was the only symbol we hadn't used. That, that was the library that was left. And this, this whole, what he's talking about had to be enabled by some interfaces that um, because the APR 38, we were lucky. Earlier in the early in the development of the APR 38, we got a bunch of guys on board, uh, government guys on board from Warner Robins, Georgia, believe it or not, uh, that that we converted uh, because of multiple evenings and uh, adult beverages at uh, the Nellis Club, et cetera. Uh, uh, we convinced them that they needed to help us reprogram it and gain government control from smack air. Uh, and uh, um, they did that. In, in essence, uh, the, the PUP phase one, the, the first computer upgrade that under operational uh, was reprogrammed by the Warner Robins people. And the guys that did that were heroes. Uh, 
uh, Court Smith, uh, Court Smith. and uh, uh, Jim Hunley really started the whole thing. EF, we called him EF Hunley because when EF talks, nobody listens. Uh, and Bob Milam uh, just went to his funeral. Um, and, oh, no. Uh, that, that All those guys uh, um, grew up believing that you could do work with the, the operational folks. And I had to talk to the wing commander twice into flying an F4G down there, getting guys in buses at Robbins. They'd go up and crawl over the airplane, and that paid us so many dividends. It's unbelievable. But these, uh, Court and, and Bob and, and the rest of the guys down there would, would do anything uh, to put stuff that they saw. They said, hey, you know, we can make the 101 talk to the 38, and if we can do that, we can put in roots, and you can put a phantom range in there, and you can put on this and that. And it, it, the problem we had is constraining them and keeping them within the windows and prioritizing what they wanted to, what we bells and whistles they wanted to add versus what we operationally had to had to have in order to, to make things go. Uh, I, I, I can't tell you how important that was uh, to to pairing up, to use your term, Star Baby, of the, the APR 38 and the Wild Weasel. They stayed with the program until the very end. And it was a very yeah. interesting shop dynamic. I mean, they're enormously talented guys, but it seemed like half of them were from Georgia Tech and half of them were from Auburn. So they were always trying to match each other, you know, from exactly. their universities. And, and and you'd play that. You know, I, you can't do that in 40 words. Oh, uh, yeah, I can do it in 37 words, and you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, these guys, uh, when I'd go TDY down there to... to to work on the efficiency reports and stuff. Uh, Saturday morning, everybody was hung over, but they were Saturday morning. They all had model airplanes with WW tail flashes on the tail. And they would dogfight those airplanes, crash them, and then spend the next week repairing them for the next Saturday's dogfight. That's how in involved those guys were in the uh, development and the integration of the wild weasel. And that's why you had that stuff. Literally, the court was the guy that uh, worked on the range in Elgin. We took apart Park Ranger, and we gave him a ton of data from, and we got different attitude altitudes because he wanted to get to a place where he could off the nose uh, do a better job of ranging. And he was able to do that. And in fact, uh, oh, what was his name? Uh, Casper. Um, oh, I'll, I'll think of it in a second. He, he was working uh, first night of Desert Storm. He said, we had a lock on with range quality too, um, a lot of miles out. Well, beyond harm, launch range from Baghdad the first night, just because of that new software. Uh, the F4G had three range qualities, by the way, and we're not going to tell you the parameters of those, but range quality one was really freaking good. Okay, range quality two was good enough, and range quality three was, oh, we kind of know what direction it's in. It is, a, you know, talking about the range, it is amazing that going from the Shrike to the Harm, the Shrike, to me, my recollection is, you know, you're basically anywhere from three to eight miles, maybe, uh, you know, three would be a little too close, and but I, I don't think it had a 10-mile range, if I recall, whereas with the with the, with the Harm, uh, my, my shortest shot was eight miles and it came off like a bullet went straight down yeah and my longest shot was over 40 miles um in desert storm and it was three and a half minute time of flight and it it took off like it was going into low earth orbit so um yeah it's it is amazing how capable the harm was and and just the um that extra range quality you were talking about earlier that gave you that extra eight percent is uh it, it it was really able to go and uh, what was nice, we is we had on the APR 47, we had a little countdown timer. Um, and so on that particular shot, um, it was at night. So the at about the, it counted down from three and a half minutes at about the two second left to go, saw a little flash in the distance. And about a half second later, the signal disappeared. So the best of our knowledge, we had three independent indicators that kind of correlated that uh, we actually hit this that site at 42 miles so that countdown indicator was another bar napkin 
yeah, that was that was brilliant. It uh, it it really helped. Yeah. And yeah, again, you have to realize with a relatively ancient computer system, what the computer is doing is running essentially a timing model based on when you took that shot, and it's it's that's how it generates the countdown. Okay, once it generates the model. Um, you know, the target's not moving, right? So the situation's going to change. It just needs to run the countdown. But it, it had to have some smarts, and that was done with very clean, very limited code. Was it was it generating a model, a model in real time then? It wasn't just a table lookup. It wasn't, okay, range, altitude. Well, so the system didn't have the, the, the six-stop six uh, simulation itself within. It was more of a table-driven kind of thing. Uh, everybody wants to go put the model inside the airplane. The F-16 guys still want to do that. Ain't going to happen. Lockheed even wants to put it in the airplane. Ain't going to happen. Uh, TI's or Raytheon's not going to let that happen either. Plus, the amount of time it takes to go run those models is just amazing. Byron, Byron spent untold hours running six DOFs to populate that lookup table. And I retired from the Air Force. He taught me how to go use that on the VAX machine. And up until the day I left the Air Force, we were still running it on old machines. We finally upgraded out of the VAX world, but it, not much better. Uh, and it would take days to go do a full profile to go get a footprint on just one altitude, one launch scenario. Yeah. And and uh, when you think about the variables there with the altitude, airspeed, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera, off access, uh, he populated that table and, and he and uh, Court and Bob sat down and they figured out a way to package it. And like you say, it was very clean code and very well done. The Net 5 guys out of George that, that flew the flew the test missions and the guys at Warner Robins that did the software changes, it was it was really good, uh, a good combination between the two groups. They all got along well together. They were all pushing for the same thing. And uh, so when you get to Desert Storm, you went through years of uh, lots of lots of feedback back and forth and the test guys and the, and the software guys on how can we go you know, just get every single bit in there as efficient as possible to make it all work. And the good part of all what they did is is, is a lot of that knowledge and all continued on into you know, the Water Robbins uh, side of it, you know, the uh, into the ALIC portion of the world, and in the HTS side of it, uh, a little bit of it in, in the design of how the HTS started out. Not how it started out, but how it ended up finishing up. So a couple of times then, you as a collective have mentioned um, off axis or um, off bore site capability. <clears throat> Talking to people like Ben Fuller and um, you know Lucky and and you guys T Bear and, and ET, it's obvious that with the strike there was a basket you had to to fly. I think I think uh, Ben Fuller said it was twenty degree cone or something like that. Um, what, how important was the development of that off, off bore site or off axis capability, and um, what did that do for tactics development and, and your ability to sort of parry the, the SAM operators? Well, well, let me let me start with the first part of that is the, the AGM-45 was, a, think of it as a straight ahead field of view. Uh, if you can see it out in the front of your window, you're, you're probably in the side view, field of view. But the problem is, is finding the launch angle to optimize the rocket burn because it was dumb. It was attempting to uh, lock on to the, whatever was in its nose cone, and you wanted to put it in the basket of the the um, overhead the emitter. And in order to do that, you had to make some assumptions. In the 105, we used to do a, what they called a dip check, bore sight it, and if it was this amount below, you pulled this amount above. And the rule of, what was a rule of 20 ed that we used to use that. that uh, add 20 to it and then and you were still a guess and if you came back home you'd sit down with the real tables you were lucky if you were plus or minus five degrees of uh the right kind of launch angle to hit the basket uh immediately the the, the guys at robin said well crap we can put brackets up on the scope and get you in there and your flight path would be this the plus sign and and just get within the brackets and you'll You'll optimize your shot. You probably added uh, two tenths of a PK with just those brackets, using the, the altitude, airspeed, pitch angle, etc. Uh, from thanks to the Warner Robins guys. But then everything had to be off nose, as he said earlier. Uh, 
in Vietnam, if you ran out of missiles, you still pointed your nose at the bad guy and started a pull up and that uh, portended that you were going to launch a, a strike at him. They didn't know whether he had one or, or not. So one of the, the things about the harm that uh, we learned after Desert Storm was that for some purposes, the off boresight capability was hampered by the fact that the missile is too damn fast. So if you took a large off boresight shot, okay, the missile comes off going the speed of heat, and now it's got to convert a lot of that energy into a turn. So what we learned too afterwards is we would we would it was faster to actually turn the jet, even a phantom, to point in a more general direction of the target than it was to let the missile do the job. So we got in the habit for shots, particularly range unknown shots, of the front seater would slam the airplane around. We'd get to X degrees of the nose, which was still pretty wide, and then we'd let that sucker rip because the missile then had a shorter time of flight because it wasn't piddling away all its energy trying to make that turn at the speed of snot. Yeah, the first uh, five seconds of the burn is when he's trying to turn and he's trying to accelerate. So you're, you're wasting all that energy. And that's always a trade-off. Yeah, the, uh, the, the harms we've been talking about so far are the ones that didn't have any kind of real good uh, navigation capability. But just before I retired, they finally got fielded the, uh, what they call H system, harm control, harm control system module or whatever it was. Anyhow, I put in a, uh, a GPS system into it. So you can actually get the lat long down to fairly good accuracy and hand it off and It'll basically do point to point if you want. That is one of the modes is a point to point mode. Uh, so it's, there's been quite a few advancements on it. And I think they've carried some of that over into the uh, Argam and uh, Argam ER and whatnot also. But yeah. yeah, the latest Air Force version, the 88D, I think it is, has got the, the GPS uh, IMU loaded into it, which it really improves a hell of a lot. Yeah, and the Argams are amazing. This is the advanced um, AGM-88, is that correct? Yeah, so uh, technically it's an AGM-88E. Um, and I don't think the ER has been given a letter, but that's that's kind of just a naming convention um, because they used parts from the earlier missile. Uh, those are amazing pieces of uh, technological prowess in terms of what a missile uh, can do and what you can ask it to do and what it'll deliver. Um, and the Argam ER has a new motor uh, to make it even spiffier. Yeah, it, it, being the it, technical it, term. Yeah, and and all those things are are good. And, and my my argument for, for or against any changes was okay. What's the increase in PK? Because all the rest of the stuff is kind of wasted away on the bells and whistles. And if you can reach out and touch one someone further away with the same PK, that's good. Or if you increase the PK, in, in my rule, it's almost 10%. Does it buy onto the platform? Yeah, 10% improvement in PK is pretty good. And I would argue <laughs> the same PK with a shorter time of flight has its benefits too, because smart SAM operators learned that you had to minimize your radiation time. There was a huge difference between the Iraqis in the first three days of Desert Storm and the Serbs much later in 1999. Uh, we saw that you know guys that learned survived. Guys that did not learn rapidly did not survive to pass their bad techniques along. Hmm. And that's too bad. It is really. Let me let me ask about that then. So how so we've got a good backstory for the F4G. We've got a good backstory now for the for the harm. So going to Desert Storm then, how sophisticated were you as operators? So you've got a tight system, good good integration between the missile and the aeroplane. Um, have you advanced much in terms of your tactics from what uh, ET and T-Bear would have been doing in 1972 and what you guys were doing with the F4G then in, in 1991? In my opinion, definitely. Um, I would say that, uh, as you know, the entire red flag operation that was based out of Nellis started because of all the experience and the high 
mortality rate in Vietnam uh, that was expanded. Uh, they had a similar program called Cope Thunder in the Philippines where I was stationed. So we routinely trained not only as uh, 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 you know against complex threat integrated threat systems, but we also uh, flew as uh, combined packages uh, to include international partners. So we had, I mean, at least by the time I showed up as the um, Desert Storm, I've been flying for four and a half years, but I mean, almost all of my flight time included large forces coming from multiple areas with different, um, you know, different backgrounds and experiences, all flying a published ATO or air tasking order. Uh, we, we, we spent a lot of time on survivability, uh, SAM defensive maneuvers. Uh, we didn't, to, to be honest, we never practiced <laughs> SAM defensive maneuvers at night. That was probably too high risk in peacetime, but uh, so we got to practice that uh, during the school <laughs> desert storm. So it's, it's a little disorienting when there's no stars above because of clouds, there's no lights on the ground. All you see is this wavy magic carpet floating out there at some undetermined altitude and you're going up and down, up and down, dropping chaff and flares and trying to keep track of where your wingman is because uh, during Desert Storm, I was up in uh, the 23rd uh, Fighting Hawks and uh, we were a mixed squadron where we had the uh, the F-16s on the wing. And so uh, it was it was important to try to make sure that they could follow us. And uh, so it, it was, it was uh, yeah, I think we benefited greatly and I think we did learn the lessons uh, from Vietnam. But we also had a big supporting enterprise. So, I mean, we're talking F4Gs and HARMS, but what we had at the time was called the EC Triad or the Electronic Combat Triad. And that was a unified group of aircraft and squadrons that were designed to take down an air defense system. And so the components of that were, of course, weasels. But we also had the EF-111, which had grown out of the Navy program, the ALQ-99 on the, the Vietnam era prowlers. And they installed that in a 111 airframe, took all the weapons off. And so you had a penetrating jammer that was smoking fast when it put the wings back. And then you had the third element, which was the EC-130 called a compass call. And these were jammers. And these guys would stay, I'm not going to say in safe airspace, but in safer airspace. And they had a lot of jamming power. And what they would do is they would try and attack comm links. So in navigation links. So their job is to make sure that an adversary fighter pilot can't talk to his control aircraft if he has one, can't talk to his ground control, loses some navigation equipment so that he may not know where he is or where he needs to go or be able to get a cue. So the, the same thing for the SAM operators. If your shooter radar is not talking to your acquisition radar, his chances of, of even coming on the air drop through the floor. So we had an entire enterprise that had grown out of the Vietnam experience. It had gotten better. And guys, correct me if I'm wrong, but 17th Air Force at Sembach at one time was all electronic warfare assets. 65th, 65th Air Division up at uh, Wiesbaden. Um, th they made an Air Division out of uh, all the EC assets. 65th Air Division uh, started and, and did it. And in, in, in fact, when they... Uh, when General Quarter worked, was the commander of it, uh, all the people that were involved in that ended up being up in Enselik, uh running the EC portion. And in down in uh, Victor, you remember Victor um, Belenko? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. He was involved with a, a lot of, uh, we, we fed him most of the data. Uh, the problem, we ended up, uh, the security on each other's sides ended up hurting some of the stuff because there were a lot of trials run with uh, the 65th Air Division on the integration of the EC Triad. And uh, the EC Triad uh, had run some special tests with some other assets early uh, before the 117 was public. And um, that's unfortunately sat in the uh, safe and the black hole versus being used as well as it should have been. But that, that Star Baby's right. The, the EC triad was huge and, and had been exercised in red flag and green flag uh, numerous times in order to, to uh, optimize their interfaces. Uh, one of the things that we did very early because of uh, our knowledge, uh, to go back to your first question, Steve, is, is uh, uh, Jerry Lynn 
took over uh, it was some of the early flight tests and then went to Tifwick, which was his boss at Tactical Fighter Weapons Center up in uh, Nellis. And they formed a detachment, joined with DET-5 and, and all uh, the 37th wing there uh, so that we had tactics development as, as a portion and an integration of every single uh, OFP update for either the API 38 or the HARM so that the tactics were looked at right up front and how they, op how, how they could be optimized. And, and it was a significant, it was a huge change in how we had to address the issues, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and the trade-offs between uh, what you put on the ATO, strikes versus harms versus um, HM-78 versus bombs. You know, is it time to, to clean up and do bombs and mavericks? We got some of the breadboard uh, during the FOT and of the, the APR-38, we got the breadboard IR Mavericks. So we got in day zero of the IR Maverick and uh, the the program manager there loved us, loved working with us because we'd hang it on and, and haul it around uh, uh, and, and go optimize our use. And so we had a LAW-88 and a couple of guys, the same old thing, bar napkin, a couple of guys talking to each other and we got hey, we could control the seeker head. So uh, we did the mod, uh, you know, it was a small mod, and he just buried it in the in the LAW 88 budget and uh, allowed us to interface with it. And we were able to steer uh, the, the seeker head of the, the Maverick using APR 38 pointing. Wow. So so the radar warning receiver would, would cue the Maverick seeker. And and you could steer it and, and help you put your point Field of view right on the area where the, the target should be. And boy, that helped big time, especially if you're going the speed of heat and low altitude. And the, the, just to correct one use of terminology, so the, the APR-47 is so much more than a radar warning system. Yeah. So, you know, we often called it a radar attack warning system uh, because it, it really, it, it should have been warning the other side that a weasel was coming. Um, because it was not focused on, you know, keeping you out of trouble, which, by the way, it did very well. Yeah. It was focused on giving you the tools you needed to, to basically put some some warheads on foreheads and make it go from there. One of the, the things about weasel tactics um, was, you know, using the wingman. But the wingmen were, were of course, we're all weasels, right? We're self-actualized. So if you looked at Desert Storm... And we looked at it after the war. And this is where I kind of come into trying to study up because I'm not a Desert Storm hero, right? So I'm showing up late as a lieutenant and I'm not a war hero. So I got to make a name for myself some way. And that means I had to do a lot of homework um, and build on, you know, a lot of the knowledge that guys before me had accumulated and were willing to, to pass on. But one of the analysis pieces was after the, the Gulf War, and I don't know if it includes the sorties from the North, Bossa. So I don't know if you're in this. There were 21 engagements against F4Gs in which the enemy SAM operator supported the shot from beginning to end. Okay? And of course, all 21 F4Gs survived that, but that's not the important part. The important part is in 14 of those 21 engagements, the wingman killed the SAM site uh, as part of the defensive act. So targeting an F4G deliberately with the intent to shoot them down turned out to be a very dangerous proposition. And a bunch of guys who uh, were capable of executing modern tactics very quickly with some big brass ones. And that's, that's huge because we spent a lot of time on the attack side of that house. And you're absolutely right. And every now and then we had to warn ourselves uh, uh, that, that this thing is to quote the Bee Gees, Staying alive, staying alive, ooh, 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 staying alive. And, you know, uh, we used to forget that frequently when working to optimize the kill. But the system was, first, you have to stay alive to do the job, then do the attack stuff. How did you think, then, you would fare against the Iraqis? What, 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 I mean, so because a lot of this, so you've, you've, you've been 15, 20 years without real combat experience. So obviously, you've got some assets out in the desert you can test against. You've got red flag, 
there are lots of ways that you can validate your technologies and and to some degree, I guess, your your tactics. Um, but how did you really feel then you were going to do against the Iraqis? You know, Iraq infamously had a a, a well designed IADS. I think it had been built by the French doesn't necessarily mean it was well designed but it means that there was a, a western component to it there was some western thinking behind it um what what did you think about iraq and and how did you expect to do well i showed up um i was the uh the last person that showed up in my squadron the 23rd hawks in spangdalem uh had flown for four years in the philippines and you know four ship flight lead and so back to a wingman at spangdalem been there for a month and uh, we spent a lot of time uh, in that month, uh, we flew a lot with the French, the F1s, because the Iraqis had F1s, and so we arranged for um, uh, some flights with them, just to not only uh, not so much the fighting capability, but more the electronic signature, which was our piece. Um, and then, and then, um, I I would say the the mood was that we thought we had been given a bit better weapons and tactics and therefore an advantage compared to the folks from Vietnam. But uh, there was certainly an expectation there were going to be uh, losses, uh, especially especially with the weasels going out there in front, because when we did launch, at least up in the north, and I believe it was uh, pretty similar in the south, you know, we would launch almost like a red flag or Cope Thunder sortie where we'd have 60 aircraft launch out. Uh, we'd have the F-15s air to air up high uh, and back protecting the, the high value assets like the tankers and the AWACS. And then the, F, uh, the F-4s and the F-16 weasels, we would go down south of the target area close between the target and Baghdad. And that's where we would uh, set up our caps. And so uh, we, we, I think everyone was surprised that we had no losses. We didn't have a single loss. So uh, that was, that was pretty, uh, phenomenal but once again i think that was the um part of it also was the uh, not only was the the training i think appropriate that we had in and the planning and the weapons but the the targeting done by the folks out of riyadh it, uh, the kind of targets that they selected and the ordnance and the packages they put together to make that happen uh, and, and 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 the sequence of targets they picked i thought also was very smart and contributed significantly to uh the success of the campaign is is the the triad that we've talked about that star babies referenced and and we'll talk about this again in more detail in our third conversation you know the dismantling of that triad but is it obvious then when you're out there performing the mission in in january 91 through march that that you're part of a triad are you coordinating with the ec guys are you coordinating with the f111 guys i did i did a series of, of interviews with some ef111 driver well driver and uh, an ewo from um, uh, from back then, and they talked about how they were going to shut down the search radars, um, and that would leave you guys to kill the tracking radars. Did it feel like you were part of a team? Definitely. Um, I think we were a little bit isolated compared to the much bigger effort down south. Uh, so we were all essentially, except for the B-52s coming out of Maron, Spain, or or wherever they were launching from. Uh, we were all self-contained on Insulik, and so we had a lot of conversations prior to the um, prior to each sortie. So yes, I think we we definitely had a integrated plan. We understood the ATO was well thought out. Uh, we did understand how we're some people are creating diversions and distractions for others. Uh, we would intentionally pick. Uh, we would we would intentionally based on the targets and route of flight. We would intentionally. Uh, obviously target those surface to air missile sites that were close to the routes and close to the target and then ignore those that were not, even though they were potentially, you know, more lethal, more accurate, as, as long as they were farther away, then we would, uh, we developed enough confidence in our system and our capabilities to execute reliably that we would actually ignore certain SAM sites um, and focus on, even though nothing was up, as long as it couldn't affect the package coming in would actually ignore it and then uh, save the harms or uh, pop-up targets uh, close to the threat. So I think we did, um, you know, we didn't have the diversity of assets down there, but, uh, but we certainly, what we had, we definitely did coordinate and I thought it was a very integrated package. 
Well, it was integrated at a higher level too. Uh, uh, I was by the, by this juncture before Desert Storm. I was stuck in the basement mops of the uh, basement of the Pentagon, and when the uh, in August when they started uh, Kuwait, uh, it was needless to say scramble mode, and putting together uh, what teams of what expertise in order to strategically uh, address the issue. Well, Ninth Air Force scrambled to get the teams together and get them in the country and get things sorted out. Uh, but from a big picture, strategically, uh, um, I was able to join the, I was ended up being the defense suppression side of the house and we were able to sell it. And it wasn't a big fight, quite frankly. Uh, Navy and uh, Army jumped right on board with it uh, to uh, the first night of just trying to squish as much as we possibly could of all our defenses um, up to and including uh, uh, Pavlo's leading A-10s uh, to, take out, to take out some stuff we, we couldn't address and the EF-111s couldn't address. And so let's just level it and they're fixed targets. And so uh, A-10 flew nighttime with goggles following Pavlo's to, to, to go over and beat up the site and kill it. Uh, the overall picture was to try and diminish that French built architecture and uh, zero it out. And in fact, uh, well, uh, the, the first four 117 bombs dropped uh, were targeted at nodes that were critical to that system. Uh, Save the second bomb. The second bomb was a purposeful dud uh, sent through the window of the Secretary of Defense for the Iraqi. <laughs> and a purposeful dud in the sense that, hi, we know where you live. How are you doing? And so uh, when. Sorry, when Basa talks about um, the tactical integration, right, and the briefing with everybody, so he's also talking about, he, he kind of led into this, right, whereby we're only going to target the SAMs that are a threat. But in order to make that assessment, and by the way, weasel crews are making that assessment in real time throughout the entire length of the mission, you have to have a really good idea of what people are hitting, what they're carrying, what their delivery is going to look like, where their target is, and what their time sequence is. Uh, so not only the strikers, you also need to know where the air-to-air -air guys are because up until the end of its life, the F-4's radar, the G model, sucked. <laughs> uh, and, you know, from an EWO perspective, I was if I was in the APR-47, I wasn't playing with the radar. So somebody else was going to have to look out and the pilot really didn't have the ability and didn't actually have the controls in the front cockpit to take over like a strike Eagle does. So integration and an understanding of where you fit into a clockwork, like moving four dimensional arrangement is part and parcel of doing a defense suppression job. Yep. And, and, and how does doing that at something like red flag, in a large force exercise translate into doing it for real then is uh, you know does did, did me, red flag do what it's supposed to do in that sense for me with the with with the Inzerlik operation which was almost exactly like red flag you have you know 40 to 60 planes of all types from AWACS to tankers to fighters to bombers all taken off from the same single runway um, and we did it at night calm out so we're, we're taxiing. We, we start engines on time. You sit there and you're looking at your lineup card, waiting for the tail number to taxi past you that you need to follow. <laughs> That's who you follow out. We never, we never said a single word on the radios until we were finished refueling and pointed south in, into uh, Iraq. And that was all for um, OPSEC because the, uh, they had a lot of people on the order of the base that would make phone calls when we took off so anyway we were trying to delay that but bottom line is i mean that that is exactly what a lot of the red flag and cope thunder exercises were is uh, you know, diverse packages systematically laid out um there are contingency plans if you 
end up taxing late, you know, there's a there's a plan to get you back in there and what, how you rejoin. Um, so I, I I I am confident we could not have done what we did without Red Flag and 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 Cope Thunder. It was for me, it was a direct preparation. For the benefit of the audience, you know, the purpose of Red Flag uh, and the large force exercises was to get people through a bunch of stupid mistakes. So a post-war analysis out of Vietnam came to the conclusion that the majority of fighter aviators lost had been lost on their first 10 missions. The data is there. I mean, it, you just have to comb through it. And so the purpose of Red Flag and Green Flag then was the electronic warfare version of it and Cope Thunder was the Pacific Air Force's version of it. The purpose of that exercise is to get an aviator through all the stupid mistakes they are otherwise going to make in combat uh, in an environment where making a stupid mistake can be debriefed and it's not lethal. It might be embarrassing, but it's not lethal. And, you know, my experience... It's always embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> it's always, it's always embarrassing. embarrassing. Oh, yeah, my, yes. favorite, my favorite ever is getting oh, up in front of a oh. red flag debrief. Oh, and admitting to a mistake. Were you with me when I flew through uh, uh, Tonopah? Was that you with, with me? Of course not. If I uh, were with you, we wouldn't have flown through Tonopah. Yeah, um, well. Yeah. But I was with somebody, I think, uh, was still in the red flag films where they show an F-4 flying through a bunch of bomb explosions uh, because we hadn't been briefed who was delivering live. Um, that could have been me and you. I just don't know. Yeah, yeah. yeah a lot of shenanigans. Yeah. Student gap. Yep. The one I really remember for you and I, Bossa, is me making the dumbest statement of my flying career, which was during the brief when we had they were briefing the emergency procedure, and the emergency procedure of the day was utility hydraulic failure, and I said, and I quote. You know, Bassa, I've never had a utility hydraulic failure, oh, thereby good. tempting the gods. No kidding. Before <laughs> we, we took off, we headed for northern Iraq. We hadn't even hit the 50 mile circle around Insulik when Bassa says, uh oh, and we had a utility <laughs> hydraulic failure. Flew back, took the cable. Uh, well done. Great. Yeah. At that point, I'm just running the checklist and cheerleading. It's like, you go. <laughs> oh yeah so many things so so, so back to iraq then were, were the iraqis any good i think you know they're, they're they may have been individually they may have been motivated and um, um wanted to do well but I, I i don't think you know to me flying is a very perishable skill uh and you know being able to maintain like a subconscious mental clock and compass of where everyone else is. I mean, that, that takes a lot of practice to get to that level of uh, ability. And then it takes frequency after that to maintain that currency. And so I don't think, you know, whether they're Iraqis or we flew with Slovakians and we've, I've, I've flown with Turks. I've flown with a lot of people that in other countries that don't get to fly a lot, that fly once or twice a month. And they're invariably, uh, just trying to get the airplane in the air and safely back on the ground and nothing in between. So I think um, I, I, in some, I think they turned out not to be as good as we initially thought, um, but it's hard to discern how much of that was because they weren't flying enough, how much of it was because they had, you know, a very regimented philosophy on tactics and then how much of it was how effective the campaign was to, you know, take out a lot of the um, early warning and uh, you know, command and control nodes. So it's all three things, I think, blended in that they were much less effective than, than we thought they were going to be. What about systems then? It's interesting, again, reading Star Baby's um, article, which I'll, I'll link to in the description for this, and, and we'll make that you know, part of the conversation for the next interview. But, he, you know, he, he makes the observation that at the start of the Gulf War, I think, so January 91, there were five or so threat systems, um, you know, ma major threat systems. Um, and in Vietnam, there was the SA-2. So there was, you know, the SA-3, SA-5, SA-8 came out. Um, there was the Crotal 
Roland, you know, so there were, I don't know. What were dogs. Yeah. You know, so, so were they, were they good systems? Were they uh, difficult to kill? And back to the perennial question, was it about suppression or was it about destruction? And you can't quantify suppression. That's ah, a problem. But you can quantify the results yeah. of whether or not you're losing aircraft. So, I mean, T-Bear's right, right? If you don't lose aircraft, you can't prove it. It's because you had a good suppression uh, effort. But if you do lose aircraft, you know you had a crappy suppression effort. And we're seeing yeah, that on the screen right now. Yeah, and it's not one minus. That's a problem. And and uh, suppression, I mean, for years, our argument is you suppress them. You know, you put your nose to him and drop some chaff, and he thinks that you're shot a strike. And if he pulls the plug, you suppressed him. Uh, you know, it, it, I, I agree with you. Survivability was huge. I won five dollars off of uh, Colin Powell because um, the, all the models said that we'd lose X number of people the first night of the war. I said there are models. There are models. Uh, you were given alternatives, four or five alternatives. Not that was the least number of people we lost, but that's not an absolute number. It's a relative number. I said the bet was there would be more people killed in Detroit that night than in because uh, Detroit was a hot number that particular summer uh, than there would be in the Iraq War the first night. And I won the bet. That's, I still have that. That's the first time. first time I've heard that. So I've I, I've, I've heard the thirty thirty percent number trotted that many times, but it's the first time I've heard that was actually that was the worst case scenario, and there were many other models. Kind of reminds me of COVID modeling in a way. Um, well, yeah, well, models are, are tools. People think of them as absolutes or not. They're tools to use to decide between alternatives. And, you know, modeling something that is, you know, predictable uh, yeah. is one thing. Modeling something that is inherently unpredictable uh, is a different story entirely. It doesn't even, in my mind, get to best guess. To go to your question about how good were the systems, um, some of them had proven very good. The SA-6 had just mm -hmm. savaged the Israeli Air Force over the Sinai Peninsula in 1973. Uh, that's where it got its nickname, the Three Fingers of Death. The SA-2 Vietnam era, but it downed a lot of aircraft in Vietnam. The SA-3, SA-3 is the airplane, is the uh, SAM system that got the F-117 in Serbia. Mm -hmm. And uh, Fingers Goldfiend's F-16 in Serbia. So, you know, uh, I've been shot at by the SA-3, and it's scary. Um, you know, the the SA-8, shorter range system, um, you know, again, a fairly interesting system. One of the advantages we had in Spang Dalem, and we haven't really touched on this, but when the wall came down at Spang, the East Germans had a bunch of Russian-built air defense gear. So a number of us got to go and meet up with the former East German who are now in the German military. And they gave us an instructional course on their systems. So I got to operate Soviet built systems. And I'll tell you, there's one, I'm not going to name it, but it's still in service. It has an easy button. It's yellow. It's not red, but basically you establish a track on the airplane and you punch the easy button. And the next thing, you know, there's a missile in the air and it's basically uh, getting guidance from an automatic system. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but again, you know, a, a point that I'll make over and over again, you're talking to a bunch of guys that were flying Phantoms. We were not the newest airplane in the stable at any point, you know, after Vietnam. And yet with well-trained crews that got good flying hours and well-constructed uh, training, we were consistently uh, able to do extremely well. So we can talk about how good the system is on paper, and that's all great. The, the system is not the capability, the humans, the capability. And, you know, the, 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 because of the Vietnam experience and because of all the effort put into defense depression after the Vietnam War, and because of things like uh, red flag, green flag, you had a superbly trained group of individuals tasked to do the mission. The war was time for the apex of their training, quite frankly. Uh, I mean, literally, we had just fielded the, the, the PUP phase one computer, so everything was optimized there. HARM was fully operational by that time. We had had plugs, and so guys could train with it and stuff. 
um, and and the we 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 as the outsiders uh, at the base of the spear instead of the tip of the spear. From our experience, we were trying to give them all the tools possible, and uh, uh, literally. I called the president because the Dean Club was the president of TI at the time for harm, well, for all of TI, but he, he had been an engineer in one of our, when I was a captain and he was an engineer and I was a colonel in the Pentagon and I called him, I said, Dean, we've got all our airplanes going to Seymour Johnson and we need the, the new prom boards in those harms because we're taking them with us and it's the first day of the war. Uh, what we take with us is what we got. And he said, figure it out. We'll take care of it. We'll get the people there. Just get me on base. And uh, with a phone call, literally, they, uh, TI, sent engineers to Seymour, uh, went on the airplanes, changed the prom boards on the missiles, which had never been done outside of the factory. <laughs> but they, they were motivated. They did it. And uh, we went in with the newest hardware. What was a prom board? Prom board? What was a prom board? It was uh, hardware that acted like software. Uh, it's uh, software uh, based, but you had to blow the proms onto the board uh, and then replace a sheet of hardware. That's a, a different way of loading software into the platform. It's programmable read-only memory, correct? Uh, which is just a way of saying it's a piece of hardware where every time you want to change the software code, you have to also replace the hardware. But it's just a chip. It's it's almost like the electronic version of a punch card. Yeah. We had to blow the prom, so we had a prom queen. <laughs> I would say that the uh, Desert Storm would have been very different if we hadn't had harms. If, if we had still had strikes, I... I, I, I I can guarantee you that we would have had losses because I mean, I never, my closest shot was 10 miles. I mean, with strikes, my farthest shot would have been eight. So I, there, there's no way there wouldn't have been losses with, without the harm. Can, can I ask about dynamic targeting then? I mean, we, we, I'm getting towards the end of my timeline. I've got to wrap up fairly soon, but, but, but dynamic targeting. So we're talking, you've talked a lot about how the harm's going to let you shoot at somebody outside of their, engagement envelope that's fantastic we've talked about fixed sites we've talked about you know range known uh, range known capability i guess before you go out the door if you know where a fixed site is and then the airplane being able to calculate your range known um when you're in the air using these three different levels of um you know certainty what about dynamic and pop-up threats and that's something maybe again we'll talk about in the third in our third conversation with regards to the Balkans and their ability to move SA6s, SA8s around. Did you have much of that to deal with? And if you did, how easy or difficult was it? Let me just preface, Baza, let me preface this with uh, the range quality piece. And that is, they're all dynamic targets. Okay? Because any information you take off with on the location of a SAM is probably wrong. And so that's the huge aspect that's critical for weaseling is everything's a dynamic target almost all the time. If you know where it is, task somebody else. Okay, Basa, there. There's your lead in. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. So so I mean, I mean, some of the sites obviously don't are very difficult to move. And so, you know, like the SA twos and the you know, threes to large degree didn't move that much. And so we would have awareness. Uh, all the other ones we would always we would still use the information that we got from the aircraft versus the pre the, the, the information given to us during the briefing. So, so in that sense, it was to a degree was always dynamic targeting with, with the older targets, not really moving, but, um, but still the, uh, but the harm was very, um, was very capable with, with, with uh, pop-up short notice. Um, the, that shortest shot I took at around uh, nine or 10 miles was a uh, pop up right on the nose and we were right in front of the strikers. And so we knew it was a threat to the strikers. It was a threat to us. And in, in when that signal came up in less than a second, the uh, back seer had fired that, fired that harm off and it just took off and just nosed over immediately. 
and uh, time of flight was on the order of like 15 seconds or something like that. So it was it was um, it was it was quick. So I I I, th I think the harm was very capable at short notice pop up. Uh, as we talked about earlier, it's if it's off bore sight and it's in close, then you know then you want to turn the aircraft like we talked about earlier. But uh, still, it's it's a uh, thought was uh, was very useful. Those those range quality figures were not preloaded into the system. Those are what the airplane gave you. And you know, there's actually a little time budget between the number of time and electron, the amount of time between an electron hitting the jet. Computer goes through its spin, identifies the electron, starts a ranging sequence, and then there's also a time where it gets to the display. But on the Nellis range, I have seen emitters come up where in those little couple of fractions of a second assembled, um, the system was doing its work so well that by the time the thing appeared on my screen, it was range quality one. So you get a range quality one pop up. The airplane did that. You did not preload it. You did not have any knowledge ahead of time. The airplane did it for you. And now you're off to the races. That's yeah. And that's good news. Bad news. Uh, the good news is that it, it became range quality one real fast because guess what? It had real good data because it was tracking you. Yep. It was pointing <laughs> at you. It was probably a good high frequency radar. Yeah. Um, but again, yeah, that's we, saw, we, we, used to, we used to see that in test. It was easy. I mean, yeah, as soon as you, if you got locked on by XYZ and he just sat on you and highlighted you, boom, 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 you'd get range quality one in a heartbeat. But we also got a cue, which is unusual. We got a cue in the system that told you is 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 you put crosshairs around it. We called them track bars. That if the computer thought that guy was tracking you, it told you. It basically gave you that little handoff and said, "Hey, dude's on you. You're it. You're it." Dang. Hopefully, yeah, no tagging. Well, it, it, that was an interesting algorithm, Ed. You were in some of these discussions. And just generating that algorithm, when to put track bars, yes, no. There was a lot of discussions and what was correlated, not just signal amplitude, it was a lot of other things entered in that decision. Because once you've got track bars on something, it, we wanted to have confidence that that was telling you really no lie, take a time out and work this issue. <laughs> Is is it a given then? So so I guess range is is the emphasis because that's the most difficult one to produce. Um, but is it a given that you've got the azimuth? Because if you great if you've got the range, but then you've just got an arc if you don't have the azimuth yeah, tied down. But 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 part and parcel of how the system generated uh, range was a bunch of very sharp azimuth angles. Orthogonal. In both azimuth and elevation, it's a 3D solution generator. Yeah. Um, so, so that's so what, azimuth, azimuth drove getting rain. So azimuth, azimuth was very fine. Okay. And you'd get azimuth, you know, very rapidly because, again, 52 antennas. So for certain bands, you know, you've got 10 antennas covering each quadrant, and they'll give you an azimuth pretty darn quickly. You could rely on the azimuth. If it was an air target and it wasn't ground-based, by the way, it gave you azimuth and elevation of the emitter on the display. That was really, really good. Mm. I would, frankly, I would take the Tape 9000 APR 47 and match it as a warning system against any current electronic warfare system on any fighter in the world. It generated what you, call, what you would call a harm pie. It was sort of a, an error that would basically look like a pie shape. And you knew with fairly good confidence that the missile or the target you were looking at was within that harm pie. And the missile itself would then try and adjust its uh, field of view to match that, that, uh, that shape and, uh, and detect and basically guide toward the target. F final question from me then before we, before we wrap up. Having spoken a lot then about this range known capability being able to figure out exactly where this emitter is and star baby you said you know giving very very detailed um, instructions to the harm about where to go to hit that target um if the emitter came off air what's the likelihood then that the harm will still strike 
the target. Uh, could could they foil your attack? Let's say I know you won't talk specifics, but let's say if they come off air, could they foil your attack, or is the missile still going to have a pretty good chance of getting to where it needs to be? Yeah, I'm not going to touch that one. Good question, though. Well, it's it's a it's simple factor of what what time of the time of flight or path. You know, if you if he tickled you and made you launch and then pulled the plug and didn't stay on the air, there's a lower probability. That's just straightforward. Now, if you pulled the plug two seconds prior to impact, pretty good chance it didn't matter. So it's timing. But the point but there is... The and some accurate uh, lat longs handed off, um, it may not matter whether he turns on or correct. off. Correct. Correct. Um, he did have the ability to hit lat longs, but uh, but generally that's not enough fidelity with that size warhead. That's correct. not enough perhaps to cause correct. substantial damage to hardened targets. No, so, I, was, I was talking with the, with the new 88D with the GPS. Obviously, oh, with, the, with the Bs and the Cs, you're correct. Uh, yeah, yeah. So it it so Steve, it, it did have some capability, and and you know we would use it as a last resort, but that was not preferred. But it didn't matter because if the guy turns his radar off, you just won. You suppressed wow, that's him. That's right. Okay, you did the mission. The 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 you know killing Sam's is great. And, you know, I, I really can't say enough about it from a fun perspective, but from a military effectiveness standpoint, get the guy to shut down um, because a radar that is not on is not a threat. Until the next day. And that's the only the only drawback. But I agree with you. It's uh, if he's not on the air, your your mission is accomplished for that day. But we. Uh, yep. Still has his missile guidance beam on the air. Has to. Big time. Has to. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, again, it, what we used to talk about, if we were actually a tritting SAMS, we would refer to it as campaign seed, campaign suppression of enemy air defenses, in which by over time, you know, you are actually a tritting the size of the force. So day to day, um, you're suppressing the activity. That's what you need to do is you need to get the radars into a position where they're not a threat to friendly aircraft. But as time goes on, you're making guys explode. And so over time, you end up with campaign seed where the adversary ends up with less, fewer systems than they started with, and equally importantly, fewer operators than they started with. And those operators are much more hesitant <laughs> to stay on for very long. <laughs> they do get hesitant. Yes, they do. So, so having said that, that, I've asked my final question. This is my final question then. On that, personal risk. But the personal risk to you guys being shot down is very clear. Could they not just put a a van with a, I don't know, a network cable running a couple hundred meters away from the radar dish that you're actually going to go and strike. Is it, would it be that simple for them to mitigate their own personal risk? Sure. So, yeah, so but could they do that with on carriage uh, missiles and on carriage radars? That's the problem. Right. If so you if got, you if, if you do that, no, they're no longer mobile, right? Hmm. So if you, if you look at older systems, SA-2, SA-3, they actually have control vans where the operators are separate from the system. Yeah. Once you get to SA-6, you know, it's a, it's a vehicle that has the acquisition radar, the target tracking radar, and the missile guidance radar all in one spot with the operators in the vehicle. Same with the SA-8, same with the SA-11. I mean, these are all uh, systems where it's a design choice. Yes, you can remotely... Um, place your personnel and if the radar explodes your personnel survive the experience but now you've got a, a system with a lot more literally moving parts to put together and it's no longer as mobile which the intent was is to, to be with the army group supporting the army uh, as it's on its march forward hmm. and if it loses its mobility it's no longer doing that hmm. so it's a mixed bag here there's move counter move move counter move our, the, the weasel had command control. It had the, the detection, the execution, and and the warhead uh, to be able to do that all on one platform. That's the that's the beauty of the weasel. Thanks for tuning in to Ten Percent True. I hope you enjoyed this episode. 
Feel free to subscribe, and if you're on YouTube, hit the bell button to make sure you get notified of the next episode. Thanks, and take care.